എല്ലാവർക്കും എന്റെ വിനീതമായ നമസ്കാരം It's wonderful to see a hall full of such remarkable young minds and I'm delighted that so many of you are being honored today by the 60 schools which you have graced with your excellence and your achievements are today the focus of all of us in this institution. I'm delighted therefore to express my own congratulations to each and every one of you for your accomplishments in both the 10th standard and the 12th CBSC examinations. Give yourselves a hand. You'll be getting some awards this morning, and I think that all the qualities that our president has already mentioned, your application, your hard work, your focus, your diligence, and the enabling environment provided to you by your schools, all of those are being recognized in these achievements. There is one thing that I hope will not follow, and that is complacency. An academic award is a matter of great pride, but it is not an occasion to rest on your laurels. Your accomplishments today are but one step in a journey you must continue to undertake. If you ask me for how long, the answer is for a very long time indeed. I'm probably older than many of your parents, young students, and I still haven't stopped learning. I think if you will approach life with the belief that every single day ahead of you is an opportunity to learn, and that each day imparts some new knowledge, some new insight, some new word, some new idea, some new learning, then you will embrace that and you will learn throughout the rest of your lives. And I urge you to do that because I've always believed that the human mind is rather like a parachute. It functions best when it is open. Just as you don't want to jump off a plane with a closed parachute, <coughs> you do not want to approach life with a closed mind. An open mind is the biggest asset that you will take with you as you go forward. You've all done very well in your examinations because examinations are the yardstick by which your excellence has been gauged. But that's another reason to avoid complacency. Because the truth is that while examinations measure certain qualities, in particular your ability to study hard, your ability to absorb and retain information and knowledge, and your ability to reproduce it in the exam hall, those are not the only qualities that the larger examination called life will demand of you. Many of you have heard that some of the big achievers of our time were people who dropped out of college, did not do well in school, and would not be recognized in an excellence award ceremony today. Bill Gates is the famous example of that. But the truth is, you don't want to be like him either. You have achieved something. Those are the yardsticks, the goalposts that society has erected for you, and you want to continue achieving along those yardsticks. But you must be conscious that life is more than you have been able to reproduce in your examination papers. And that applies not only to all those you left behind in the race to get here, but to you too. Because life has this inconvenient habit of asking questions to which the answers cannot be found in your textbooks not even necessarily from the lectures of your teachers. Life asks you questions to which you have to find answers on your own. And that too requires habits that you may have learned in school and you may not have learned. One habit, of course, you have definitely learned, and that is taught to me by my old boss, Kofi Allen, the then, understand, the then Secretary General of the UN, who always told me one simple principle of his to live is to choose. You chose. You chose perhaps to give up an evening going out to the movies. You chose to avoid uh, an outing with your family, a dinner party somewhere, in order to study and focus on your examination. That was a choice. You will make more choices in life. What to study, where to study, 
what to do in life with your studies. And all of those choices will ultimately define the life that you will lead. But that's not the only thing that you will have to decide. You will have to decide how to approach those questions that life asks you. Those questions to which, as I said, the answers may not have been learned from the textbook. Professor Albert Einstein, famous, famous physicist, said once that the mark of true education is what is left behind in your mind when you have forgotten everything that you studied for your examinations. It's not just what you can learn in the textbook. It's those attitudes of mind that will see you through in the future. It's been even more true in the 21st century than in the 20th in which Einstein lived. Because education in the 20th century was largely about ensuring that you all would have well-filled minds. A well-filled mind is one that's crammed full of facts, figures, formulae, calculations, learned up lines of poetry, like the one we heard today about full many a flower is born to blush unseen and wasted sweetness of the desert air. See, I knew that by heart from school as well. But a well-filled mind is not of particularly great use in the era of the internet, where in the real world, once you've left school, any fact you can't remember, you can find out with two clicks of a mouse in a couple of seconds. And given the computing speeds are growing, it might not even take a couple of seconds by the time you want to look up something that you forgot from school. So a well-filled mind is not the objective of your education. What we need today, what all of you will need as you step out into the world ahead of you, is not a well-filled mind, but a well-formed mind. What is a well-formed mind? It is a mind that has been shaped and taught not what to think, but how to think. What to think is the old style of teaching. How to think is what will be useful to you tomorrow. Because what to think rests on the knowledge that is already known. How to think enables you to grapple with what you don't know. How does your mind react to unfamiliar information? When a problem is presented to you that you've not encountered before, how do you tackle it? What from your education guides you towards adopting the right approach to that unfamiliar information, to those facts you haven't seen, to those figures, problems, issues that you have not encountered before. That will ultimately guide your success in the real world of the 21st century. So I always tell the teachers that I meet, don't teach the kids what to think, teach them how to think. But how do you teach them how to think? It's getting more and more challenging. The Oxford Martin School has issued a study recently, a couple of years ago, that says that 30% of the jobs in the world in 2030, and 2030 is just seven years away, so all of you will be looking for jobs perhaps around 2030. 30% 30 of the jobs in the world in 2030 will be jobs that do not exist today. How do you prepare children for jobs that don't exist? How do you train people to do something when the process they were made to use hasn't yet been invented? It may be a spark in somebody's mind. It leads to an innovation. Something new crops up and suddenly there are opportunities for you to work in a field that didn't exist yesterday. That's the kind of world we're living in. And so habits of thought become extremely important. One of the challenges in our school rooms and I'm not saying this is true of any of the schools you have been to, but generally speaking in India, is that we tend to overemphasize rote learning and underemphasize creativity, originality, discussion. If any of you have had a teacher tell you to stop asking questions, I'm afraid that teacher did not do you a favor. You should ask questions. And what is more, you should not just ask why, Something is the way it is, which the teacher can tell you from the textbooks. You also need to ask, why not? Why can't it be some other way? Why is it that something has to happen this way? You know, when we lit that lamp, 
Why is it that the ritual of lighting the lamp, which we do in every function in Kerala, starts with the easternmost week and goes around in a circle? I'm sure some of you know the answer, but there is a reason, and it's a scientific reason. The lighting of the lamp is meant to mimic the sun rising in the east and circling the globe. That is why we light the lamp going around the surface of the lamp. So the point is that you need to be able to do that. But you can also ask a teacher, well, why can't we do it the other way? Why can't we start somewhere else in the back? Why can't we skip a few weeks? Why, can't, why do we have to do it this way? And the teacher can give you an answer. This is the logic on which it is founded. You can't do anything about the way the sun behaves. The sun always rises in the east. It always goes around the planet or the globe as the earth is spinning and turning around the sun. And that's why it's that way. So you can't change that. Fair enough. But once in a while you can ask, why not? I'll give you an example. Perhaps some of you, if you've had the habit of wasting time on YouTube, might have seen me giving this example before. But I'll give it again anyway on the assumption that the majority of you are too busy to waste time watching my own speakers on YouTube. And that is an example of why not kind of thinking. You may have heard Bill Gates saying, you must think out of the box. But what does the out of the box mean? Thinking inside the box is the conventional wisdom. It's what you've been taught, what you've been told. That's thinking inside the box. Thinking outside the box is imagining things that are not the way that you're being used to and that you've been taught. So some years ago, I was complaining to a friend that I was losing and breaking too many pairs of glasses. And he said, why? And I said, listen, I, I only need glasses about 5% of the day. I don't need it to read the names of the people on the podium today. I don't need it to even see the first few rows. But if I have to recognize a friend's daughter on the back row, I would need glasses. So how often do I need that kind of situation? Maybe once in a little while, I would need glasses. So maybe 5% of my day. The rest of the time, I tend to park the glasses in a pocket, bang into a wall somewhere, they break, or I put them on a table, forget them, go away to the next event and then realize I don't have my glasses. Or, especially, I used to wear mundas more often than pants, there are no pockets in mundas, so I would leave my glasses on my lap and then I would get up to greet somebody, the glasses would fall to the floor, somebody would step on them, they would break, so to cut a long story short, in the first three months of that particular year, I had lost or broken six pairs of glasses. So the friend said, but why is this happening to you all the time? And I said, because for 150 years, glasses have only been made one way. They sit on your nose and they hang on your ears and I find that uncomfortable. And that's why I don't like wearing them. So he said, oh, oh, that's the problem. It's the why not problem. And he went away and a few weeks later he came back with what I am now wearing around my neck. It doesn't rest on my nose, it doesn't hang on my ears, it doesn't bother me most of the time. But it's there, I don't have to put it in a pocket, I don't have to leave it on a table, I don't have to drop it on the floor. And when I do need to see somebody in the back of the hall, all I have to do is to lift it up and it clicks into place with two magnets in the middle and I can say hello to the girl in the back and take it off again. So the simple example of out-of-the-box thinking. In other words, we know the functional purpose of glasses is to put a lens in front of your eyes. Is the only way you can do it the way it's always been done? And the correct answer is no. You can think of new ways of solving old problems. And that's the challenge all of you will face in the world into which you're going to go. But it gets even more complicated than that. There is a further problem that you must be prepared for. If 30% of the jobs in 2030 are the jobs that don't exist today, 30% of the jobs that exist today will also disappear. What happens to all of you if you enter a profession full of expectations, you take out a bank loan for a flat, you take out a bank loan for a car, and then the profession disappears? And I'm not talking in the air here. I'll give you a very concrete example from India's own experience. Your high achievers sitting here 20 years ago, when they were entering the job market after they finished their colleges, they might have heard of a profession 
in which India was a world leader, a profession called medical transcription. You know what medical transcription was? It wasn't possible till the late 1990s when fiber optic cables were laid throughout the world. But when those were laid, American doctors said, hey, we've got a great idea. Normally, American doctors would see their patients all day long. Then they would have to call their secretary and dictate notes about each of the patients. The secretary would charge overtime. The secretary would make mistakes in typing up the notes because she's not trained medically. The secretary might fall sick sometimes and be absent. She might have entitlement to annual leave. It was an expensive, cumbersome and inefficient system for all the centuries that American doctors were working that way. But then, when fiber optic cables were laid, Indians who had English and computer skills and quickly learned necessary medical terminology, Indians were able to offer medical transcription, which meant that an American doctor at the end of his long day in America could dictate his notes into a computer, it would be zinged over the internet to India. While he was going to sleep in America, Indians were waking up in the morning and typing up the notes singing them back at the end of the day in India, so when he came to work the next morning, almost miraculously all his notes were ready and available to him for consultation. Very few errors because of quality controls. The training offered by these medical uh, transcription companies was excellent on American regulations, American accents, American terminology. India became a world leader in this business. 95% of the global market was in India. Companies were mushrooming all over the place. I'm told in Chennai alone there were 25 companies doing nothing but medical transcription. And indeed, the young men and women who were joining those companies were taking out car loans and bank loans and, and, and mortgages, expecting that they would be doing this for a long time to come and they would be even better at it as time went by. But they were wrong. What they did not anticipate was the invention of voice recognition software and artificial intelligence which destroyed the business model completely. What's happening now is that for the purchase of one software one time, the American doctor has a software on his computer, he just speaks into it at the end of his day, and almost more miraculously than he had in the past, he sees his own words appearing on the screen instantly, he can make corrections on the spot. The artificial intelligence programming learns from his voice, so if there's some words that he pronounces in a peculiar way that initially is not recognized, but the second time, third time it's recognized, corrections are made automatically, and the next thing you know, you don't need to pay people in India to do something that your computer does for you on the spot. End of medical transcription, which was a sunrise industry 20 years ago, is now in a sunset phase. A similar example, perhaps less dramatic, is America had a shortage of radiologists. So when they did the MRI scans, it was a long queue for people, available radiologists, to read those scans. Again, thanks to the internet, the big hospitals in America would zing the MRIs over to India, where qualified radiologists who are not qualified to practice in America, but in India, they would read the MRIs, give the diagnosis back, and a doctor in America would just look at that, sign off on them, and the MRI scan was read. That too, business model gone, artificial intelligence is now scanning the MRIs and giving automated readings that are far more accurate than any human, human beings can be. The British journal Lancet published an article last month that they had actually tested a large number of symptoms on a thousand doctors and on an artificial intelligence program. The artificial intelligence program did better than the human doctors were specialists 97% of the time. Why? Because a human doctor may have encountered 100 cases with those symptoms, maybe 200 cases with those symptoms in a lifetime of practice. An artificial intelligence program can scan tens of millions of cases around the world with those symptoms and come up with a very precise diagnosis. So what happens to doctors now? They will soon, in many ways, be outsmarted by machines, by their own computers. Of course, doctors are very smart people. They will find ways of using the computers to further their own skills and careers. But I'm just saying that the world is now going through changes we cannot imagine. 
A few years ago, this would have sounded like science fiction fantasy. Today, it's reality. Tomorrow, the world will change again. And by the time you all go into the workspace, I'm sure you will be using a tool that doesn't exist today, a software, a new program, because the world doesn't stop inventing, the world doesn't stop moving forward, the world doesn't stop thinking about how to do things differently, how to think outside the box. How to think is always the key. So learn how to think. Teach yourselves how to think. Let your imaginations run wild. Read. I know I've got this undeserved reputation for using too many long words. I hope you haven't heard any long words today that you couldn't understand. But if you want to know more words, there's only one magic formula. I constantly get asked in colleges and schools, teach us one new word, and I will teach them all one simple word, read. Okay, that's how I acquired my words. Read widely, read extensively, read indiscriminately. I'm not even telling you only read high literature Nobel Prize winners. Read anything you enjoy reading. Believe me, just seeing words used liberates the mind. I once said that a book is like the toddy tapper's hatchet, the poduar, that cuts through the rough husk of a coconut shell. It also cuts through the rough husk that often enshrouds our minds to tap into the exhilaration that ferments within. That's what you need. You need to be able to be provoked into thinking. You need to read new things, unfamiliar things, discover words you haven't thought about. Discover words also that you haven't thought about. And you come across the same word in three or four places, in different usages, in different contexts. You won't even need to look up dictionaries. I hardly ever do because it's obvious from the meaning. From the employment of the word in the sentence, the meaning is obvious. And that's how you can enhance your vocabulary. I've taken too long. This is a day actually to celebrate you. But I was asked to say something that might ignite something new in your minds, and I hope I've tried to do that with these words. Think afresh, but go out and enjoy it. My last word of advice is for parents in this room. Please do not seek to live out your frustrated hopes and ambitions for your children. If I had to point to one great moment in my life that enabled me to escape that future, it was the large-heartedness and large-mindedness of my own parents, particularly my father, so I'm talking about a much older generation than anyone represented in this room. Because I used to be inconveniently good at taking examinations. I came first in everything all the time. And when we had to stream, in those days it was in class nine, uh, because of the senior Cambridge system, um, I chose humanities, not science. And the teachers of the school were so upset, the principal also, that they summoned my parents to the school and said, why is your son, our best science student, choosing humanities? And my parents were like all middle class Malayali parents who wanted a doctor or an engineer to grow up in their house. They summoned me and they said, what's going on with you? Why are you, why are you choosing humanities? And I said, because I dislike science. And they said, don't be silly. You come first in science throughout your school. And I said, that's only because I know how to write exams. The day after the exam, I forget everything I've studied in science. But if you ask me about history or literature, I know far more than I was taught in school because I read about those subjects beyond the classroom, beyond the textbooks. And my father very graciously said, all right, study what you would enjoy studying. And I did, and the same thing happened when I taught the country in the, in the senior Cambridge examinations in my year used to be called five points, the best you could get in the country. And again, he said, all right, now you've done well in humanities, go and study economics, at least you'll get a good job and make a lot of money. And I said, no, I want to study history. And he said, what on earth are you going to do with history? It's a useless subject. And he said, it's what gives me happiness. And he said, all right, study that. And similarly, at the end of college, when again I topped at the university, he said, please do the IIM entrance examination. If you're good at taking exams, at least go in and see whether we can get you a job in some Hindustana is multinational and make lots of money. And I took the entrance exam. There were only two IIMs in India in those days. I am Ahmedabad, I am Calcutta. I came first in one, I came second in the other. I don't know what, what went wrong, but anyway. At the end of all that, I also got a scholarship to go and study international politics in America. And I told my parents I'd like to do that. And again, bless my father, so he allowed me. So the life I have led has been a life where I have followed my own instincts, my own bliss, not listened to what adults thought was better for me. 
And I want to say to the parents here, I know this is not your instinct. I know what I'm saying is going to perhaps create problems for some of you at home. But it's so important. You are not the ones who are going to wake up in the morning and go to work. You are not the ones who might one day make a contribution to humanity and fail to do so. You are not the ones who are going to live, live the happiness, the frustration, the challenges that your children are going to experience when they become your age. Let them follow their bliss. There was a cartoon I remember seeing of an Indian elephant talking to a baby elephant. And the Indian elephant is saying to the baby elephant, you know, my son, I want you to achieve everything that I could never achieve. For example, I never learned to fly. Now think of that cartoon for a minute and think of that poor baby elephant with the parents expecting him to fly because the father wanted to fly and he couldn't. How can the poor baby elephant ever fly? Don't place impossible targets. Some are made to fly, some are made to achieve and the outstanding results in other areas and other work. Give them a chance to be who they are. And to all of you kids, the final word is, be the best version of yourselves that you can possibly be. Nobody else can be you. So be the best you that you can be. And life and the world will take care of itself. Thank you all very much. My warmest congratulations to all of you. And I officially inaugurate this excellent celebration.